All right. Hey, VBAdrenaline.com followers and on YouTube, welcome. Uh, in the middle of December madness, if you will, the first weekend of the tournament's over. And we're uh, lucky to be joined by uh, a good friend and somebody who's been gracious with his time, uh, Dan Meski. 2022 ABCA assistant coach of the year and uh, uh, the Cardinals are in it again and coach thanks for getting up and having a cup of coffee with me today and what are your thoughts after the first weekend of the tournament well obviously we're, we're excited to still be in it so um, it was really fun I was uh, and we were talking before we came on but I was as surprised as anybody that it, it it really kind of went the way everybody kind of maybe thought it wouldn't go because there weren't so many upsets or anything like that. But um, yeah, it was, I, I, everybody in the tournament is very, very good. You know, with our draw, um, you know, Western Michigan, the quote unquote upset Auburn, who was the seeded team, but they really handled them. Auburn didn't get to 20 points. And then, you know, Western Michigan had 31 wins on the year yeah. and just, they were fantastic. They were a great team. So I just feel like every round of two there, that first and second round, everybody at that point knows how to win. Um, so it makes for some great matches. So to see all of the mainly seeded teams advance, I thought was pretty surprising. And and I guess it does for setting up TV. And we'll look at those brackets here in a second. But for setting up TV and the uh, the Sweet Sixteen and and you know Elite Eight possible matchups, TV you probably want those big names. But in essence, I think the you know the March Madness was built on those big upsets, right? And volleyball. Um, maybe it's because it's a best of five format rather than, you know, one and done, whatever there, there really weren't those, but it does work out nice, uh, because you're going to see some big name matchups, uh, starting on Thursday. Yeah. And we were talking about exactly what you were describing there is like in basketball, if somebody has an out of body experience, they go nuts. Well, you, you might not be able to get back in that game. And in volleyball, it's like, that's only one set and you got to win three of them. So, you know, Wright State in our first round, uh, they jumped out on top of us and we weren't able to close the gap and we go down 0-1, but then over the course of the match, okay, we're able to recover and we win 3-1. But um, I think that's why volleyball is different than, um, th that's why volleyball is different than basketball in that sense of like, in basketball, it could get away from you and it could just be over before, before you even have a chance where in volleyball, you get to reset, which is kind of nice, especially for us in the first round, we lost to Wright State. If we were only playing one game, we might not have been able to come back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's jump in and let's take a look at uh, just what you were talking about. Um, just my speaker here. Your uh, your guys' bracket. And uh, the one we talked about, I, I thought it was the most interesting heading in. Um, but everything sets up. I, I was really impressed with Creighton. But what was your thought just on your overall the overall region? Did I lose you there, Darren? You were cutting yeah, out. Yeah. Like, I missed the end of that question. I'm sorry. So, no, that's all right, bud. Um, so just talk about your, uh, your overall region. And when we came into the bracket show, this is when we talked about the most. But um, I, I was definitely impressed with your guys' next opponent, Creighton. But just your overall thoughts on the opening weekend in the Pittsburgh Regional. Yeah, so, you know, starting with us, like I said, you know, Western Michigan, I thought was maybe the most under the radar team and playing them and prepping for them and then, you know, ending up winning that match. I felt like, again, I'll compare it to men's basketball. I felt like they were like Florida Atlantic. Like just the fact that we swept them didn't mean that the team was capable of, they were like a Cinderella that didn't really get to get, they didn't get past us, but there was no reason they couldn't. I mean, they were a fantastic team. So we feel really fortunate to come out of that. Uh, pot of four there. Um, really good. It was just really good teams all around. So um, then look, Creighton, you know, I really wasn't following that. We were playing Thursday, Friday, and Creighton was playing Friday, Saturday. So I did have a chance to watch a little bit more yesterday, but we weren't really, you know, following that closely because we were in the midst of our first and second round. But Creighton's fantastic. I mean, you know, they did most of what they did throughout the year without Norris Sis, who's unbelievable. Yeah. And now they're back to full strength. And I think Creighton's as good as anybody. They're as good as they've ever been. Um, so that's going to be a heck of a matchup. And I think it's really cool on that side of the bracket. We got two awesome female head coaches that are going at it there that one of them's going to the Elite Eight. So I think that's really special. You look at the other side, we played both Pitt and Washington State. So it's not surprising to me that they got out of those pods. Um, 
you know, Pitt playing at home, they played in their big basketball arena, which that's where we lost in five late in the year. Um, they're just, I mean, they're good home and away, but they're just such a solid team. Um, I thought USC would give them, you know, a, a challenge, which they did, but USC can get pretty one dimensional. And I think Pitt, you know, the way that they prep and the way that they break teams down, I thought they'd probably be able to neutralize uh, Skylar Fields, who's pretty fantastic. Um, and then Washington State, you know, that was that was on the West Coast. So most of the time I was asleep by the time they were playing those matches. I really didn't follow that one all that closely. And again, Washington State playing at home. Uh, we played Dayton. I see their record at 31 and two. Yeah. Um, they took us to five at their place. They were phenomenal. And so I thought they'd give Washington State a match. But Washington State's physicality. And if you look at their roster, I've never seen a roster with so many seniors and graduates. It's, I mean, it's unreal. It's almost like a pro team, Washington State. So they're just so poised and just good at what they do. Um, it doesn't surprise me, the four that we have. But um, three great female head coaches, which is cool. I think two years ago we had an all-female head coach uh, round of 16. We had Ohio State, Florida, and Georgia Tech, um, which was really cool. And um, I don't know. It's just a really exciting bracket. So a lot of great coaches, a lot of great players. It's going to be really fun. And, I mean, everybody talks about uh, the – when you get to this point, I think hopefully, you know, uh, fan base should be looking at some more five setters, um, some more. Not that the first couple of rounds weren't competitive, but there were some matches that were over in a, in a hurry. Um, you're getting to some teams that are pretty evenly matched um, and on a high level. Creighton coming in on well, one of the nation's longest win streaks, I believe. And uh, and a program, you know, they even talked about it playing with a little bit of chip um, as to how things, you know, getting beaten round one last year, um, a little bit more focus. They played that way this weekend. And, and then the big, um, you know, matchup that I know you guys can't talk about yet, but a lot of people have been talking about that potential uh, round three with you and Pitt. And it's just cool. The rivalry that's become in your conference and the high level of success, both those programs have had. Yeah. I love your graphic too. Cause I was looking at the rivalry and like the angry Panther and the angry bird, like those are just like really angry mascots too. So it's cool that they're at the top there. Uh, cool rivalry. And you know, just uh, that match, who knows if that match is ever going to take place or anything like that. So we don't really think too much about that. We don't talk about that at all, but I will say for Pitt and the development of the ACC and of our program, um, it really does remind me of, you know, there's like, you just think of rivalries and how they, you know, they make the, the people better. And so when we got in the conference, I say we, the new coaching staff in 2017, myself and Danny Busboom Kelly got here. Um, Pitt was kind of the program to start chasing. They had just really gotten to the top of the conference, but they hadn't solidified that yet. And uh, they were the standard. And the way that they broke down the conference, the way that they were running the table, um, you wanted to strive to get to their level. And then once we did, then it was, okay, how do we – you know, make the jump. And then we've constantly kind of gone back and forth. Yeah. But then with that, the whole conference itself has gotten better. So this year, you know, Pitt and Florida State split the conference championship. We're, you know, in second in Georgia Tech right in the mix too. So um, on top of chasing what you feel like is the top or trying to solidify yourself at the top, the rest of the conference has gotten so much better. So um, that's a big reason. I mean, back-to-back -back Final Fours before this, we've had two ACC teams. Unfortunately, you know, the ACC teams remaining were in the same bracket. So mathematically, it's impossible for us to repeat that. But that yeah. was really cool. And, you know, we'd see the other coaches at the AVCA convention, the All-American Banquet, and you know, we were celebrating like we were on the same team being that conference of just the All-Americans we had and, you know, what the conference was doing. So that was really cool. But I think that's just more so for how both programs have elevated. Um, but at the end of the day, like back to you said, that's really all focused on. And you know, about Creighton having a chip on their shoulder, you know, looking at the development. And I know you do a lot with recruiting. So the, rec the way recruiting has changed has made the rosters currently so interesting. So take, for example, Anna DeBeer on our team. Well, she committed to a Louisville program in 2018, I think, that had only been to four Sweet 16s, had never been to the Elite Eight, um, had struggled, you know, was at the top of the ACC, at the bottom of the ACC, back and forth. So she really committed to a vision. And then she's seen that grow. Um, you know, you take Creighton, for example. Creighton, during that time, was an established top 25 program. They had all the momentum. They had all you know, everything was rolling for them. So we would go up against, you know, Creighton recruiting and we couldn't yeah. hang, we couldn't get any recruits. So I look at the roster that Creighton shaped and I'm like, man, these are all kids that told us no, you know? So it's like very interesting because by the time they become seniors, 
Well, back in the day, we used to recruit freshmen in high school. So once those kids finally get there, I mean, there's players on their roster that I remember from eight years ago watching at club. Um, so I know how loaded that roster is and how good they are. And then take with that how well they're coached. Um, I think that's the cool thing is we're the first match on Thursday. So yeah. on the West Coast, you can set your alarms and get your coffee ready. On the East Coast, you can watch midday. I think that's going to be just a phenomenal match. Um, I know it's going to be a battle. And like you said, the sweeps and all that, I think that's gone from the rest of the tournament. I mean, it's going to be hard to sweep any teams that are remaining. Uh, no, now, now you got me excited with you talking recruiting. Those are the questions I love to dive into. But uh, unfortunately, we just got to talk boring bracket stuff right now, I guess. But uh, um, there there are a lot of similarities in a lot of these programs. Um, so that, that'll be tipping off Thursday. Let's run through quick and just give me your take on um, – couple of the regions here so the big one you know the number one overall seed um one i uh you know we talk a lot about kentucky and i compare what you guys are doing and what craig's doing in kentucky and just that state but they're playing as good as anybody maybe really under the radar as well um maybe not as much national attention but but man they swept through a weekend um like no other and and looking at a potential matchup with Nebraska but what are your just quick thoughts on on what's left in the Lincoln Regional That's a fun one um yeah. you know I coached at Nebraska for a number of years so I know what yeah. that crowd feels like and what that environment feels like and so when I look at Georgia Tech I mean Georgia Tech is an emotional team they've got great servers they've got you know just fearless attackers so I think that's a really tricky match for a Nebraska team that you know, on paper is probably a huge favorite, but you just can't you you can't see on film the passion that Georgia Tech has. And, you know, we've battled them for, you know, seven years since we've been in the conference of like it's never been an easy match, regardless of if they have Julia Bergman, who's, you know, a Brazil national team member, or, you know, people thought that this year was going to be a rebuilding year for them and they're as good as they've ever been. So I think that'll be a really interesting match. And on the other side, I agree with you. I think Kentucky is playing fantastic. We caught them at the beginning of the year when they were kind of figuring out their offense and what they were doing. Um, they've since you know switched some rotations and solidified how they're going to go about winning and you know they get another SEC opponent here and they've shown that they've you know kind of figured out the recipe to beat the SEC so um, I don't know I think it's going to be really interesting I'd, I wouldn't be shocked to see any of those teams come out of that region just because of how hard all of those teams play I mean you look at Arkansas too they've got you said chip on your shoulder earlier you know they're outside Jill Gill um, is so fun to watch and I mean man it's just again all those teams play really hard so I think it's going to be a dogfight there in Lincoln yeah, and uh, you want to talk about a home court advantage, uh, uh, you know, you're going to play extra special, I think, to win there just because they will definitely get a home court advantage, but uh, should be some great volleyball. And personally, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I want to see that Kentucky. Uh, I'd like to see that Kentucky-Nebraska matchup and and just see how far they have come because uh, they are night and day from what they were doing back in August, September, I guess. So, um, so your region and then Wisconsin, any, can anybody go into Madison and, and knock them out? Looks a lot like a big 10 regional. Yeah, I got, I went, again, when I was at Nebraska, this is 2011 or whatever it might have been, um, the same thing with the big 12 and it ended up being like the big 12. Now what happened was there were actually four big 12 teams were in the round of 16, because again, you know, I think it's Penn State here beat the number four Kansas. So not all teams held seed and you end up with three Big Ten teams. But um, this one I know the least about. Uh, we only played Penn State. And again, we caught them really early. They got a lot of new players. So they were still figuring things out. And we had that match at home. Um, so the Penn State that's playing right now, I probably don't know as much about. I feel like they're very different. Um, but I, I don't know. I would, if they're trying to figure out how to beat Wisconsin in this regional, I would look back last year and watch what Pitt did because Pitt was able to do it at Wisconsin, which is pretty yeah. impressive. So, um, again, this is one of those, those like regions that I, I don't know much about these teams because, like I said, Penn State is so different than when we played them and we didn't play the other three. We didn't have a lot of common opponents with the other three. So, a lot of times you'll see on film, oh, that's who they were playing. I mean, I, I really just have not seen a lot of these teams. So um, it looks like a lot of physicality um, produced from our neck of the woods. I know they got two gnarly outsides, but um, gosh, nothing would surprise me in this one because I don't know much about it. 
Uh, again, I think that's one where the home court uh, will definitely serve well. I, I like what Oregon's been doing. I like uh, Matt's program and we'll learn about it. But but uh, but a tough task, I think, uh, to go to Madison, especially with them coming up short last year. A um, little bit of, you know, we keep talking about the chip. Um, um, th- they might have a little extra motivation to get back. So um, going to be interesting, but good chance a Big Ten team uh, advances a squad there. And then <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> and then this one, um, you know, I talked coming in the tournament how um, nobody was really talking about Texas nationally. Um, you know, despite being the defending national champions, struggle a little bit right out of the gate with AM, but I, I don't know much about Stanford. Again, it's my early bedtime, and when they play, um, I'm guilty of that. But but what can you tell me? ASU has been a great story. I know that. I, lo- I love Arizona State. Ellen Andrews yes. is an assistant coach there who I worked with back in my South Dakota days out by you. Um, so I'm so excited for what they're doing with that program there. And uh, they swept Stanford earlier in the year. So, I, again, that's – when you look at – we just went through all the 16 teams remaining. Um Obviously, Arizona State is the big outlier where it's so hard to make the Sweet 16. There's Most of these programs have had their staffs in place for seven, ten years, sometimes yeah. even much, much more than that. Um, so for Arizona State in a first year – like coaching staff um i think it's pretty pretty awesome what they're doing and it's also if you're stanford it's really dangerous too because there's so much belief and there's so much momentum versus these coaches who have been in the sweet 16 you know these players who have been in the sweet 16 or they've been in these matches before um yeah there can be nerves there but also just the newness of it um i remember our team in 2019 when we were unseated, we ended up beating Texas at Texas in the Sweet 16, but it was so new. It was just, you know, we didn't know any different. Our players mm-hmm. just played out of their minds. So it can go both ways where your players can be really uptight and, oh, the moment's so big, or they're just like, hey, this is another game and we're just having fun. And those are the teams that are really dangerous. So um, Stanford, I know, is probably on high alert, having already lost them this year. Um, and then, yeah, Texas, is they're like not – I mean, there's not a team that's more loaded than Texas that no one talks that much about because they have such good players players have like probably an Olympian in the middle right now and um so obviously they're pretty they're pretty great and then Tennessee you know they're it feels like they're really on that cusp of really jumping into that kind of top 10 top five um huge you know their lefty is phenomenal um it's going to be a complete battle so yeah we just went through all of these sweet 16 games and there's not one that seems like it's a huge heavy favorite of like oh I'll be shocked if that team doesn't win I mean I think every single one can go either way yeah, and I think uh, maybe the days of somebody just, like you said, sweeping their way to the Final Four um, might be gone because of the parity and, and and increased parity, not in a bad way, parity in a good way, which you talked about, multitude of rosters just being more talented rather than maybe a top two or three in the country, as it has been, you know, maybe in past years, right? 